as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Real Fans, Real Talk. I'm your host, Emma Marie, and I have my two guys with me, Trip Young and Legends in Two Games. What's going on, guys? What up, what up, what up? What's good? Let's get to it, man. So, as you guys know, uh, sports is rolling in. NBA season is getting ready to uh, resume, and they, the players have headed to the Orlando bubble. So in previous shows, you know, we just talked about what's going on with COVID and how these players are supposed to adjust with this new season um, in Walt Disney. And we've, you know, read some feedback and just heard some players speak about this. It is literally a bubble. Um, how do you guys feel like they're going to be able to socially just handle this and, and play with these circum under these circumstances? Um, if you want to win a championship, <laughs> you're going to get locked in and, and, and you're going to do it. Uh, shout out to John Morant because, uh, you know, there, there, there was a whole big thing about the food and whether it was good or not. And he was just like, man, don't go a lot. Like, <laughs> we playing ball. We come, we came here to play ball. If you're really trying to get to the playoffs, you're trying to make your mark. You know, like, guys, guys like LeBron James ain't worried about worried about that. They, they worried about playing. Kawhi Leonard, those guys, they worried about getting to that to that championship. You know what I'm saying? So if, you, if you're trying to win, you're focusing on, on just getting – straight to basketball, and they'll work out, you know, all of that stuff as, as they start getting acclimated to the system. Because at the end of the day, right now, they don't know, you know, they don't have everything worked out. It's, this is all uh, trial and error. But I think as the players, man, listen, you got to worry about, worry about getting back to basketball and, and getting your mind into that into that zone again. Because I know a lot of guys, even, you know, when we had Scoop on, he was talking about it. Uh, well, a lot of guys hadn't even touched the basketball, to, you know, since COVID, uh, the whole outbreak started. So I think they really got to be focused on getting getting back into the zone. For the um, younger players and, and some of the single guys, it's going to be a pretty easy adjustment. Um, we saw, as you mentioned, John Morant talk about the food and say, hey, look, this, this is no different than AAU or, or college. You know, we just got to lock in. Uh, Patrick Beverly had posted on his Instagram, um, you know, he had his PlayStation set up. He had all his white tees lined up in his closet. Um, so I think for those guys, it'll be an easy adjustment. I think it'll be a lot tougher uh, for the veterans who have families to be away from your family, that kind of throws off your routine. Um, being stuck in a hotel, being stuck at the facility all day, as opposed to going home to your family can be an adjustment. But as Tripp said, if you're trying to win a championship, these are the things you have to do to, to accomplish that. You made a good point because it, it kind of, I think when you first start your journey as an athlete or just a basketball player before the league, before the, the lights, cameras, action, the cars, the money, this probably makes them feel like kind of back in the day when they first started, when AAU was the focus, right? When you, it was just you and basketball and it was like you in your dorm room, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, to your point for the more veteran players that have families, I think it's, it's, it is a difficult situation. It's already difficult being on the road with family, but now you're putting your, you and your family at jeopardy um, because COVID is still a real thing. Um, I did listen to one of the news reporters speak about uh, what the league has done to kind of allow them to get coverage. And I know we, we spoke um, last time about kind of how that's going to change the media coverage, um, just keeping distance apart and being able to be let inside the building because I don't believe they're allowing reporters on the sidelines and things of that nature. So I'm looking forward to see how it plays out. And I just, um, I'm hopeful that they will all stay healthy. Um, another thing that's obviously still uh, a huge issue um, is the social justice movement that's going on 
Um, so, you know, he's been battling and fighting COVID, but also um, just be, you know, advocating for, for black voices and black lives. Um, so the league has agreed with allowing the players to play social justice um, slogans and words and names of those who have been, um, you know, murdered by the police. So a lot of players have decided to put those names on the back of their jerseys. Um, but then you have players that haven't, who, who feel like it's not, it doesn't really resonate with them. Um, and one being LeBron James. So he has opted out on having the names on his jersey. And he feels like, listen, I, I was reading it and I was trying to figure out why, because I know he's been super outspoken about it for a long time. But he just simply said it doesn't resonate with my mission and my goal. And he's just, you know, um, opposed to, you know, uh, wearing it in the back of his jersey. Yeah, I mean, there's some people that are that are really getting at LeBron for this. Um, I personally, I respect it. I think LeBron has always used his platform for good. He's always been one of the first athletes to speak out. Um, I, but I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt this time because I understand how important someone's name can be to them. Um, and so because of the legacy that he's building for himself and his family, uh, it may be more important to just keep the last name on the jersey. Um, also, let's not forget that he has this lifetime contract with Nike. And Nike has kind of been at the forefront of social injustice, and they put up a lot of money as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if he comes out with some sort of special message through either his gear or his sneakers um, for the, the restart of the season. So I think we should give him the benefit of the doubt and kind of let it play out because, again, he's been at the forefront of always being very vocal and outspoken and supporting the movement. One thing I love about LeBron, though, too, is to me, I don't think anyone necessarily bashed him for this decision of not wearing the jerseys, but I think it just speaks to his leadership, right? Like, I think that he has never been a follower. And he's like, listen, I commend any, any of the players that want to put these names on the back of their jersey, but, but I think that he is advocating in the way that he, he wants to. And there's just like there's no way to, to, to tell people how to grieve. There's no way to tell people how to, you know, advocate and how to be, um, kind of stand in the gap for, for others. And I think that he's done it in, in so many ways. So, I mean, for him not wearing it, it's not a big deal to me. I, I think that his actions as a, a human being has been consistent from day one of what he does for the black community. This LeBron, like, can, can you really talk about LeBron? I know people, because people always want something to say just because it's, it's LeBron, but his resume speaks for itself. Um, and, and not too many athletes, you know, can actually compare to what he's doing, not even just with speaking out against social injustice, because that's only one half of, of, of what we need to do. But he's also actually out there on the front lines, um, you know, working with people on, on, on getting to, to the voting. You know, he's building schools. So he's doing all of these all of these different things. So if he, you know, if, if, if that doesn't resonate with him, you know what I'm saying? Like, who are we to be like, oh, man, LeBron, you should be wearing something on the back of your jersey. No, LeBron, LeBron is at the forefront all of the time. You know what I'm saying? He's like the, the, the go-to guy for, for, for social injustice in sports, you know? He's always uh, outspoken. He's always leading the pack. So, you know, you got to give him the, the benefit of the doubt on that one. You know, and you know, because I could imagine he probably feels like, well, all right, me just wearing this, the name on the back of the jersey or, or Black Lives Matter or whatever, how much is that really doing to to help fix you know everything that that all the systemic racism over the past couple hundred years has you know what I'm saying has put into place? So you know it's it's LeBron. Somebody else maybe I might feel a way that that doesn't do much, but LeBron is literally the person that's always active. Plus, um, I just think that not only that the list was a list that was. Um, whoever in the league formulated a list and, and kind of gave this okay of certain names and slogans. And he probably also didn't really want, like, the part about this, this movement and just our voices being heard is just, like, the empowerment of us wanting to express things in our way. And, and maybe he was like, look, I don't really like what they put together. Like, you know, you, again, it, and, I, and I don't know, when I say they, it's like, who are the people putting, who are the people that are saying here, you're allowed to wear this name and not this one and this slogan and not this one. Maybe he's like, you know what? I want, I want it to be authentically my decision on what I want to do. So I'm just gonna not do that. You know what I mean? So 
I think that's a, a part of it as well. We don't even know if he was in full support of even putting the names on the back of the jerseys. Right. You know, so he may have been one of the players who said, hey, I don't really like that. I think we should do something else. And the league chose to still go with the names. So right. he's choosing to opt out of that. Um, yeah. But his work speaks for itself and everything he's done speaks for itself. And I'm okay with it. You know, the, the unfortunate part about it is that too many times we run to athletes and celebrities and want them to be the mouthpieces for what we want them to be the mouthpiece for. And right. we got to understand that they're human beings and they have their own thoughts as well. And he may just feel this isn't for me. Right. And, and you know what? The, what I see happening in the social justice movement that I feel really passionate about is the fact that we want Brianna Taylor's, you know, killers arrested. We want justice for Elijah McClain. But then it's like, there's things going on in the world, like syrup, changing their name and like painting a street and like putting a name in a jersey so i feel like and i don't know if these are his sentiments but this is how i feel i think sometimes these movements get too cliche and it's like hashtag wear a t-shirt when it's like where is the change let's focus on the policies let's focus on changing like real like you know what i mean like all these things are happening around the country where everyone's realizing how racist the world is and they're changing the name of like the anti anti mima syrup, but then it's like Brandon Taylor's killers are still free. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of like I actually like this because it's like no, I'm not satisfied with the name of the shirt. Like we need we we need to, we got some work to do. So that's kind of like the energy that I get from it personally. Absolutely, I agree. Um, and and you hit it right on the head too. You know, there's so many times that smaller things have thrown out, like you said, changing the name of syrup or hey, we're going to donate this amount of money to this cause. And all those things long term don't really make the difference or the impact that we really need to see. Yeah. Um, I respect LeBron for this. And, you know, as someone who I take pride in my name and I could understand it and I'm not on the level of LeBron. And again, he's building a legacy for his family and his kids. So he should take pride in his name and he should want his name on the back of that jersey. Because guess what? He's worked hard to be in that position to have his name on the back of his jersey. Absolutely. Now, one if you, I'm sorry, and real quick, if you want to, you know, because Le, LeBron has been doing it, you know, Eric, you, you did mention it, but it's the uh, the LeBron 15s, the equality uh, sneakers with the with the white and the black, and those are like limited edition. So, you know, he there's, there's other ways, and equality is actually one of the the, the slogans that that was selected that they could use. So, you know, he kind of been there, done that. The right, he's been putting it on the sneakers, like you say, he had the equality pair. He's done Black History Month pair for several years now, so yeah. he has done it through his platform as a whole, not just yeah. putting it on a jersey. Now, before we um, move away from NBA, I do want to kind of circle back with COVID and just the concerns of the bubbles and the players involved. So an NBA um, physicians basically are extremely concerned with the individuals that, that have experienced COVID and the lingering effects that it may have on their lungs, um, on their heart, and just on their overall body. So I think that is still a concern, even if you did have it. Um, you know, what are the lingering effects? And so I still think, I know I'm excited for the league to come back, but the fact that there's parts in the country and states that are like LA who are going back a phase and Texas and, and Miami, it's like, I kind of am uncomfortable because these players are from states all over. And so even coming to this bubble, it's like you have people with their families and everything. So I still think it's too soon. And they're still putting themselves at risk. And then again, for those who have had it already, you know, I we don't know enough about this virus to even know how it's going to affect them in their heart and just get getting back into this high intensity sport. So well, the the good thing about it though is that no one's coming into the bubble without a negative test result. Yeah. Um. So so you know the NBA is is being as safe as they possibly can. Um, I mean, and, and, it, and it really sucks that the numbers are going back up, but, you know, that's a just, that's a reflection of the leadership in this country and, you know, how thirsty they are to try to get the economy going and just rush everything back to start, you know what I'm saying? So, and so it really sucks that we got to deal with that, with those numbers, you know, God bless so many people are losing their lives, you know, again, you know, with, with LA and Texas and, and Atlanta, uh, Florida. Uh, well, Georgia, you know, excuse me, all of those numbers going back up fast. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's 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 just a reflection of leadership 
they've been arguing all week about whether they're going to open the schools back up. You know, and it's just like, listen, man, we're not we're not ready for that. This thing can work with the NBA because it isn't a bubble. And again, everyone is has to be tested before you can enter that bubble. You have to have a negative negative test. So now, you know, when you're dealing with a situation where, all right, the virus they just ain't can't just pop up out of thin air. If nobody that's in the bubble has the COVID, it's not going. You know what I'm saying? Well, it shouldn't. You know, just pop up out of nowhere and there'd be a, a big outbreak inside the bubble. As long as you're following the rules and not leaving that, that, that bubble. The one concern the NBA should have, and I haven't heard them address it, is that the staff that's working within the bubble is allowed to leave. So right. the, the hospita- hospitality, um, you know, the, the food, the catering, all those people get to come in and out. And I think that could be a little, a little troubling long term. Um, but what I will say the NBA probably has an advantage over every other sport is they have four months to plan this. And because their season is now basically down to a playoff format, they can start getting guys out of that bubble quicker. So after these quote unquote regular season games are played, you can move on to just the playoff teams and everybody else is out. Every other sport is at a disadvantage because Major League Baseball, NFL are trying to actually start a whole season. So now it's like, how do you contain 30 plus teams who are still expected to travel around the country from contracting this virus? Um, so I think the NBA has a major advantage in that in that regard compared to other teams. But Absolutely. you're right, Em, you know, as, as we continue to see some of these states phase back into phase one, and then you got to consider at some point families are going to be joining these players in the bubble. Right. So there are still a lot of things they've got to overcome, but I think the NBA is far ahead of every other sport right now. Right. So let's move right on to the, you know, sister of the NBA, the WNBA. So right now the WNBA is experiencing just the same type of conversation in regards to social injustice. So U.S. Senator Kelly Lofter, who's also Atlanta Dream's owner, um, made some pretty crazy statements. Um, She pinned a letter to the WNBA commissioner once she found out that they approved um, the ladies wearing these names on the back of their shirts, their jerseys rather, similar to the NBA. Um, And in the letter, she basically stated that the Black Lives Matter movement was a political agenda and that it promotes, you know, exclusion and that it shouldn't be permitted. Um, The WABA standing behind it shouldn't be allowed. Um, So she received just a tremendous amount of backlash about these ridiculous statements. Um, Personally, I feel this is nuts because the WABA is 827 black women who are the players and so if you think for one second these black women don't have brothers don't have fathers or have not experienced themselves the racial injustice that have occurred in our country that they don't feel strongly enough to stand behind this then you're nuts and let's not forget this is the owner the wnba owner of a team in atlanta and this just goes back to our conversation of how tone deaf it was here I go talking about the NFL, but when they had the Super Bowl in Atlanta, you know what I mean, where there's all this historic black history has been, and you're tone deaf about the injustice that are going on. Um, so I just want to just also uh, read Kelly uh, Luffner. She basically stood by her words when she did receive the backlash. Um, she basically said this: "Sports have sports have the power to unite us, but the WNBA has embraced." the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, a radical movement that seeks to destroy American principles. I stand with Donald Trump. I stand with the American flag, which has endured for 244 years, and I will not apologize for it. My message is simple. We should unite around the American flag. We should keep politics out of sports. We shouldn't promote movements that encourage violence, and I will not be silent about it. Um, No, it's crazy. I um so I, I was going you know I was I was I had time the other day I was going back and forth on uh, Facebook <laughs> with with somebody a friend of mine she had posted up um, because of everything that went down Fourth of July weekend you know there's the, the a little uh, girl uh, was shot and killed in uh, in Atlanta so with everything that was going down she was just like you know are you are you, all you people that are anti law enforcement are you happy now? And I had to correct her. I said, well, that's not the question. The question is, are you anti-police brutality? 
Right. Um, you know, like we don't have a problem with every single police officer that's out there. We have a problem with is police officers breaking the law and, you know, killing ultimately unarmed black men and women. So that's where the, the, the problem lies. And she she actually, you know, she t- took a, a, a look look at what I said and was like, you know what, yeah, you're, you're right. That should be the question is whether you're anti-police brutality or, you know, or, or not. And um, so just, you know, just seeing all of this stuff, uh, you know, that's been going down. But I mean, it doesn't surprise me because, again, she's a, she's a Trump supporter. And uh, this is the kind of rhetoric that, uh, that Trump puts out there. But like you said, and we're talking about, you said, what is it, 83%? African American woman in the uh, in, in the WNBA. Yeah, you know I, I think she needs to go. The players are calling for her to go. You know, and, every time. Um, and in typical Trump supporter fashion, she was misinformed uh, yeah. to call the Black Lives Matter movement radical and uh, promoting right. violence uh, is completely incorrect. Um, but that's standard from anybody who supports Trump. We we've already seen that through the three plus years he's been in office. Um, I think as someone who is an owner of a team, as someone who holds a political seat, yeah. um, this is, is a terrible statement for her to make. Um, again, being misinformed, not understanding what the real topic and what the real issue is to say the thing she said, I, I agree with the players in saying that she should be removed because mm-hmm. why, why would you want someone like that in a position of power within your league when they can't even relate to the players in the league? So and this- I love that you just said that because this is a, a, a continuous conversation that we've had in the past about leadership and those who are, who are in the higher up positions that cannot relate to these girls on the on, on the court. And, you know, um, she is someone that an owner that doesn't have day to day contact with these with these women. Right. And so for you to make a blank, blanket statement, like know your audience, know the people who are even who are making you money. You know what I mean? And so I think it's extremely tone deaf and sensitive and she is misinformed, much like many Trump uh, uh, supporters. Um, And I just think that she's speaking from a place of privilege to again say, keep politics out of sports. Um, And by her saying that she's, she's categorizing, you know, Black Lives Matter movement as a political um, movement. But I just think. um, How can you keep politics out of sports when the the president (laughs) <laughs> is always stepping his toes into sports. Right, but not only that, it, you're speaking from a place of privilege to tell 82.7% of Black women who play for you to keep the Black Lives Matter out of sports when at the end of the day, when they when they get off that court, they're still Black. When they're on the court, they're still Black. When they're driving home in their nice cars to their neighborhood and they get pulled over, they're still Black. So you can't, we can't, we can't check our Blackness at the door. And so when I hear that, keep it out of sports, we like, you can't, you can't. Just like Kaepernick couldn't keep it out of the NFL. It's like, you can't. This is the reality when these players are in Chipotle getting, you know, harassed. When they are getting harassed in all these spaces, you can't keep it out of sports. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think we should keep politics out of anything. Um, that's first and foremost. And then, you know, it's, it's ironic to me that politicians love to say, oh, keep politics out of sports. But they love to get the sports endorsement. Like, Trump loves to loves to state that Robert Kraft is his friend, that Tom Brady is his friend. So they love to call on these endorsements from athletes. But then when the athletes speak up, it's like, oh, but let's keep it out of sports. No, it, it, they should be able to, to speak their mind and express themselves on any platform they're on. And again, it, it was a poor choice of words from her. Um, I think the league should definitely look into her credibility as an owner. Um, right. Because if you're that far removed and that far detached from what's going on, especially in a city like Atlanta, especially in a league that has 80 plus percent of their players who are Crazy. black, then maybe you shouldn't be an owner. Simple yeah. as that. And and just even that comment you hit on the nail when you, when you spoke about just them saying keep it out. It's only convenient to keep it out of sports when it's not in agreement to your belief. Just like when Laura Ingram said, you know, Drew Brees has an opinion. He's an outstanding athlete with an opinion, but then LeBron was told shut up and dribble. So it's only convenient to these white privileged women for these players to have a voice when they disagree with the movement that they cannot relate to. So, um, you know, to, to kind of enclose with that, they, the, the WNBA hasn't, um, has yet gave a decision on what they're going to do with her and if there's going to be any consequences, but there has been a tremendous outcry 
from these women who feel just disrespected by their owner and rightfully so. Yeah, and listen, it's not to the same extent, um, but the NBA had to deal with something similar to this with Donald Sterling. Um, yeah. You know, after years and years of him exhibiting racist behavior, uh, they finally had to get rid of him when he was caught on audio tape. And I think the WNBA is going to have to step in and figure out, you know, what's the best case scenario here. And I think it is going to have to be to remove her because if I'm a player on that Atlanta team, I wouldn't feel comfortable playing for that organization. Yeah. Well, a lot of players have spoken out. Um, so, you know, I know it's going to be an ongoing thing, so we'll see. Hopefully by, by next week's uh, show, we'll have, a, have, have some positive news for you guys at home. And uh, she'll have been, you know, told that she's going to have to put her uh, shares up. Yeah, they say, let's see him get this dance. You want to lose your job. You want to lose your job. You want to. <laughs> I'm so bad. No, but you know what? Listen, when it's your time to okay. go, you go. After, before we close out, I do want to celebrate and say huge congratulations to Patrick Mahomes. This brother sealed the deal, literally got big coins. I don't know if one of you want to take it away and talk about his amazing contract. Yeah, it's it's a baseball contract in, in the sense. Um, 10 years, 450 million. Really, it's more of a 12 year, close to $500 million deal because he still had two years left on his deal. Um, it's, a, it's a solid move for him because there's an injury uh, insurance clause in there, which would at least guarantee him about $160 million. Um, wow you know, with, with the roster bonuses and incentives, he's, he's going to be a very rich man for a very long time. And as we always talk about generational wealth, Patrick Mahomes has set up gener generational wealth for his kids and his grandkids as well. Yeah. I, um, I really, cause I like Patrick Mahomes. So I hope he's able to, to stay healthy and he's able to really play out this, uh, this contract. Um, I would have liked to seen a little more get, well, I would like to see a lot more guaranteed. And he probably has the power <laughs> to where he could have been like, listen, I'll take 400 million over, over 10 years, but I'm going to need 300 of that guaranteed. You know, I would like to see that just because he actually, he's the person that's setting the tone uh, for Deshaun Watson, for Lamar Jackson, uh, right. even Dak, even Dak Prescott. He's the one that was supposed to be setting the, setting the tone. So I would have liked to see a, a little bit more. Um, I'm interested to see what the Ravens will do for Lamar Jackson. I think uh, by the end of this season, they should be um, starting to work on on his uh, his new contract. Um, but but again, listen, 500 million is 500 million. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Mahomes. Um, I wish you success, but not too much because I want the Ravens to come back this year and, <laughs> and win the Super Bowl. But anytime you can you can set yourself up, set your family up, you know, for for, for long term generational wealth. You gotta love that. Yeah, the the, the only, uh, and this is purely playing devil's advocate. Um, the only issues I had with um, the contract was the length, which I felt kind of taken has will take him off the market in his prime years. He's 24 now. If he does play out the totality of his contract, 12 years, he'll be 36 before he's a free agent. Which we know at that point, most quarterbacks aren't as successful at that age. So he would never get an opportunity to test the market again and uh, reset the market and also see what's out there for him. Because if Kansas City isn't doing right by him, you always want to have that opportunity to seek out a team that will. Um, and then the second part of it is the guaranteed money. Um, as we talked about Trip privately, we thought this contract had to be in the range of 450 plus million. I agree. I think the guaranteed money should have been somewhere in the range of $300 million. Um, but either way, if he's healthy, he's still going to make a lot of money. To just be 24 years old and sealing that deal and to be a brother breaking the records that he has, I am super excited about this contract. And um, I just, I agree with the both of you, but definitely as far as that, the length of time was something that I was like, ooh, that's quite the commitment, you know what I mean? And so, um, I mean, we'll see. I, I believe that he'll be able to make them a better team and whether they're doing right by him or not, he's an amazing player. Really quick before we get out of here, I just want to say to get well soon. My main man abroad is chatting, and he got the, he got the uh, he got the Rona. Uh, wish him a speedy recovery. The Yankees gonna need him this season because he's trying to get twenty eight. He should be fine. I think he'll be ready to go. They say he had mild uh, symptoms, so he should be ready to go by the start of the season. So you know what I'm saying. The Mets will see the Yankees in the World Series. I'm calling it now. <laughs> well, 
Well, one of those things will be in the World Series. I don't know <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll definitely be, you know, saying prayers for him from the show and to be safe, man. Guys, be safe out there. Corona is still, it's still out there. If you're watching this, please have your mask, sanitizer, all of that, okay? Because this is real. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode. I'm your girl, Emerald Marie. Legends in two games. That's two of them, okay? And Trip Young. Yes, out of here. Bye. Live from the camp. Hey. Come on, live. Uh huh. This is real fans, real talk. talk. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. Reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emerald Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo, streets. It's Johnny Flores, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so we no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real Woo! fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Congratulations to your commitment to the University of Georgia. That is huge. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> To watch you grow from a young girl, killing the basketball game is just mind-blowing to see how much you progressed throughout the years. Um, tell us, how many offers have you gotten? I think I had around nine or ten. Nine or ten, and were they all from D1 schools? Yes. At what point of your high school career did you start recognizing your potential? I'd say um, last season. Um, the season before this past season, um, I started recognizing um, what I can do, um, but it wasn't until this recent season where I reached the heights that I thought I could achieve. And I know that you had an um, injury before. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, um, the year before last, I had an injury um, that took me out like halfway, a little over halfway through um, AU season, and I missed um, the live periods, both live periods. So that was that was really heartbreaking to watch my team play without me. Um, yeah, it was tough getting back. And then the year last season, um, last summer, um, I got injured again and missed um, both live periods. So I, I just missed out on a lot of time and opportunity. So that, that was really tough uh, getting back. Past injury, you weren't able to play AAU at all. And also for this summer because um, it's been pushed back due to COVID-19. How do you feel about missing out on the opportunity to play again? I was devastated for a really, really, really long time. Um, but then I just realized, you know, it's out of our control, and I decided to focus on the things that I need to get better at. I know during this time it's really easy to get distracted and, you know, of lose sight of it. So um, just staying on it every day, being really consistent with what I need to do, you know, eating-wise, working out-wise, things like that. And what have you been specifically working on during this quarantine, like mentally, physically? Mm -hmm. So um, first mentally, just getting to know the game better. Um, I love looking at old players, um, you know, WNBA at college doesn't matter. I like, I love watching film. Um, so yeah, just like, you know, educating myself um, a lot more on the game. And then um, physically, um, my stamina and my strength are my two biggest things right now. So I'm doing a lot of push-ups and legs and abs and I'm just, I'm going crazy. How many push-ups can you do? <laughs> so, um, every day I do 200 and above. <laughs> 200! Oh my god, I could barely do 20. All right, I'm exaggerating. I could barely do 10. <laughs> you and your sister, Kaya, are twins. Like, mm -hmm. sister, sister. <laughs> You've been playing guard, she's been playing forward. You guys are inseparable in and out. You guys developed a deep connection on the court. Um, would that be a difficult transition for you, for her not being on the same team as you? 
Mm-hmm. So I think it would take some getting used to just because I've played with her all of my life, literally. And, you know, we've taught each other so much. The, the difficult part of it um, would just be separating. Um, that That's definitely it. But we didn't really put too much time into like, oh, we're going to be separated. You know what I mean? So. Right we're more like sisters than we are really twins so you're open to playing with another forward then (laughs) it's cool with you (laughs) yeah time out we got 24 seconds on the clock you got to answer these questions real quick let me set the timer up let's do this three two one okay before a workout what artists are you playing uh chef g uh 22 g's uh jay-z roddy rich Favorite TikTok dance to um dance to? I'd say Renegade because all the memories I made from it. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. One on one match. Maya Moore, or Skylar Diggins. Oh, <sighs> Maya Moore. iCarly or Zoe one on one? iCarly. Before the COVID happened, who was taking the W for the NBA Finals? <laughs> mm, mm, I don't even know. I have not been <laughs> the NBA game lately. Um, I'll say the cats. Chick fil A or Popeyes? Popeyes. Stark Boy or Lava Girl? I gotta go with my sis, Lava Girl. Lava Girl! <laughs> Your brothers both played for Deer Park, yet you and Kaya, tran- you guys transferred from Deer mm. Park to go to Millbrook. Is there a specific reason why you didn't want to stay at Deer Park? Um, yes, actually, we, we wanted to play for um, a better basketball program, and we wanted I'm sorry, you wanted better what? Academics. Academics, okay. Who are some of the players that you model your game after, or anybody? I take bits and pieces from everyone I see, um, but when I was really younger, um, much younger, I mean, I loved Skylar Diggins um, and her hustle and her heart um, and her aggressiveness. I loved Maya Moore's pull-up jumper and her handle. Um, um, and Sue Bird, I loved her mindset, you know, being a point guard myself. Um, I just learned a lot from her and, you know, how she does things and what she does. And So, yeah, I'd say those three. What is the why to your story? Who are you specifically doing this for? So, um, I first started playing basketball because of my older brother, uh, Darian. Just sitting and playing with his friends, I was like, I want to do that. You know, I felt like I was just missing out. So, um, and my dad just told me I can't play until I get better. So, I, I worked out hours upon hours just practicing my dribbling like stalking him basically working <laughs> on the kid and I did it too so um, that's what got me started and then after that I fell in love I completely fell in love and does Darian play the same position as you yeah actually I mean now he's kind of changed to a shooting guard but um he was always a point guard so I think that's why do you go to him for advice on stuff that you can work on Definitely, definitely. Um, him, my oldest brother, sometimes even my sister, I, I get advice from him. Okay. And um, how would you describe his gameplay? I'd say he's um, shifty guard, number one. Um, he plays both ends of the floor. Um, he can shoot the ball like crazy. And he's very smart. His IQ is incredible. Thank you again, Kimora. Kimmy, for joining me today. Um, I wish you the best of luck your senior year and also for your time at Georgia. I know you're going to kill it. The dogs are not ready for you. You're going to be a savage. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me.